you got to become an expert on, you know, what non-traditional, non-clinical careers are out there, and then you can start narrowing it down. Welcome to the Doc Working, the Whole Physician podcast. I'm Dr. Jen Barna, and I'm so excited to have with me here again today, Dr. John Jerica. If you're listening and you're interested in a non-clinical career or side gig, you've come to the right place for today's episode. My guest today, Dr. John Jerica, is a board certified family physician who began doing non-clinical side jobs early in his career as a physician advisor and occupational medicine medical director. He then transitioned to hospital administration, first as a VP for medical affairs and then as chief medical officer. And in 2017, John started producing the Physician Non-Clinical Careers podcast, where he interviews physician entrepreneurs, medical directors, hospital executives, managers, coaches, and other experts in physician career transition. In 2018, he created Non-Clinical Career Academy, which you can find at nonclinicalcareeracademy.com an online educational platform with individual courses and a membership site designed to help physicians accelerate their career pivots. In 2020, Dr. Jerika, along with Dr. Tom Davis, launched NewScript, an online community of healthcare professionals, career transition mentors, and wellness specialists helping each other live a better life with a forum daily posts, mentorship programs, online courses, live stream events, and interviews with clinicians who have transitioned to a non-clinical or non-traditional career. Today, Dr. Jerika shares his wealth of knowledge about non-clinical careers for physicians and other clinicians with us, and will also bring us up to date on NewScript. Dr. John Jerika, welcome back to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Thanks, Jen. It's great to be here. That was a nice intro. (laughs) I appreciate that. Well, you've done a lot. (laughs) So it's really an impressive intro to read through and think about everything that you've done over the last several years. And you really are at the forefront as an expert on physician non-clinical careers. And we're excited to have you as our go-to person to have these conversations. And we're seeing a lot of interest in non-clinical careers and side gigs these days. How about you? What are you finding out? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of people looking to either shift gears completely or do something on the side. You know, I think just people look at their careers a little differently in the last five to 10 years. I think the pandemic kind of pushed that a little bit and uh, you know, some of it's burnout, some of it's just frustration and feeling that they're working, let's say, in a large corporate environment, which maybe they didn't really understand what that might be like. To just the other side of the coin is that there's just a lot more people like us, either doing coaching like you're doing and just dealing with and trying to meet the need for these people that are looking for other things. And it's something they weren't really exposed to during their training. So It's all moving forward and it's expanding and sometimes it's a little overwhelming. I agree. It is a little overwhelming, especially if you're at the beginning of the process trying to figure out what to do. You know, you maybe want to have multiple streams of income in an ideal world and there's so many options out there and yet it's not at all straightforward which one to choose and how to actually get from that point where you're thinking about doing something to doing it successfully. I know you help people through that transition. What has your experience been with the process? Well, it is a difficult process to step into. And I was talking to a webinar the other day I was doing, I was talking about you know how we're trained and Really, we can envision medical school, a residency, fellowship, and then like where we're going to end up, whether it's an academic or private practice or going solo or whatever, which is not happening a whole lot. But there's a whole world that is beyond that, that we can't really see because we don't really have time to do that, to look into that. Although I see a lot of really proactive residents and fellows these days, and they are looking at at least diversifying, like you said, that's a big term now you know, diversifying their incomes or their their options for their jobs and doing more than one job. 
But anyway, so everybody that is getting to the point where they're pursuing something, it really, they don't know where to start most of the time. I interviewed a few people who just got really frustrated and called a colleague somewhere and asked them what they were doing and got lucky. And they said, hey, I work at this company and they're looking for someone you want to apply, but that doesn't happen very often. So a lot of doctors and it's other clinicians too, not just doctors, obviously nurses and others are really looking to change and they don't really often know where to start. So it can be uh, really a challenge. John, I know you have a master's degree in public health and certification as a physician executive through the American Association of Physician Leadership. Is that type of additional education something that people need in order to launch a side gig or a non-clinical career? I would say most of the time, no, they don't need it. I've interviewed many people and talked to others who have thought that, well, that's the first step they should take is look to get that additional training, which I think most of the time is probably not the right way to go. I mean, unless you have a good idea of how you want to use an MBA or an MPH or a master's in medical management, there's a lot of options out there. It's not ideal to just get the degree first and then figure out how you're going to use it, because I know many people with MBAs that never quote, use their MBA. I mean, they really are doing something that doesn't require an MBA after all. So probably not the best way. But having said that, I found that getting additional certifications and degrees can be helpful if you have a plan. And I think, again, going back to the beginning, that should come become part of the plan once you've kind of worked through some other steps. And I mean, it's one way you can look at it, and I advise people to do sometimes when they're just getting started, is it's nice to align your skills and your passions with a need and a need that's going to get paid for, right? That's a typical way we look at a new business. It's what they call ikigai, right, in Japanese. It's kind of your reason for being. It's when all those things mesh, you know, your passion, your skills, and personality, And then a need out there, whether it's a need by an industry or a need by other people that you want to serve. And then you got to make sure you can get paid for it. So you can meet a need, but if you're not getting paid, then it's going to be useless in terms of finding a new career. So that's kind of a philosophical way to look at it in a way, but you can sit down and write a list of things that for you that meet all those criteria. It's not easy. And that's where coaching comes in sometimes. You know, there's a lot of coaches. That's what they do with these physicians and other clinicians who are not sure how to start. The other thing I would say about starting is, you know, it depends what you mean by starting, because I think some people are at the very beginning. And um, again, I was talking with another group the other day. And I said, first of all, you have to recognize there's a problem. Okay. So, because I think we're talking about getting past that, but is there a problem? Yes, I'm unhappy. And then making a commitment that you're going to pursue a change. A lot of people just stay unhappy. They're just frustrated. They know something's wrong and they just kind of continue in that being unhappy. They don't recognize that there might be a solution, which gets back to what we were talking about, that there are a lot of jobs out there. We just don't know about them. Absolutely. And I do think that's where coaching can come in as well to help people observe if they are unhappy to begin to pick that apart and figure out what is making them unhappy and more importantly, what they want to move toward and begin to accelerate their progress toward whatever that may be. And so if someone is thinking about non-clinical careers and they're going through that process and they've got that list, tell me about what non-clinical careers you're seeing out there. I know there are a lot of (laughs) non-clinical careers and we tend to think of maybe the top three or so, I'm guessing, utilization review, maybe expert witness work, which I think requires that you remain in clinical practice. There are some options for legal consulting as a physician that maybe don't include a requirement to continue practicing. And Mm -hmm. medical writing, what are some of the more unusual ones that are not the first several that we think of that that you've seen out there? 
let's see the unusual ones. But first, I want to add one more usual one that people forget about. If you work in the hospital environment, there are hundreds of jobs in the hospital and health systems that you may not recognize, but they're there. That's one of the reasons why I did that is because it was really the path of least resistance. Physician advisor, medical director, VP, you know, it's just natural. So, okay, some of the other that aren't so usual. You know, there's some one-offs of all kinds. I've met someone who is a patient navigator. Now, we mostly think of patient navigators as like case managers or nurse navigators for insurance companies. But I know of one physician who was so committed to helping physicians after helping her father go through a process of trying to understand his options for care that she does that she does some other things on the side, but it's an interesting one to me because she really does attend visits with patients when they see their doctors sometimes or follows up afterwards and actually communicates with their doctors for really complex cases where the jargon and lingo is just too much, like a major, you know, cancer that's life-threatening. They're getting on a protocol, they're given all these options, they have to make decisions, and she actually helps people walk through that and make decisions. I talked to another physician the other day who's also along those lines. You know, I think some of these consulting you know, jobs come up because they grow out of, like I said, a passion and a need. She's walking patients through advanced directives as a physician. And so she's still practicing, but she does that. And she has a website and she has a business doing that. And social workers will help with that in the hospital and so forth. But she helps them walk through it. And with the perspective of a physician who's you know done a lot in you know, because she has worked in death and dying and that sort of thing. Another one that fascinated me was working for a MAC. Uh, I don't know if you've been working in the hospital environment lately, but Medicare employs these MACs, uh, the Medicare Administrative, I forget what the last one, anyway, it's an MAC. And this is the one that decides whether it's going to pay for the care of patients in hospitals. And they're the ones that have the conversations between UM at the hospital and UM at the insurance company that's paying for Medicare patients. And she's actually the chief medical officer for a MAC itself. And I knew that probably existed, but I never met anyone who was doing it. She loves it. It's all remote. You know, she's just going through cases and she's doing more writing than she's doing like the UM side of it. So it just helps you know, support that system. And of course, there's so many jobs that have been created by virtue of the fact that the federal government regulates us so much. Every regulation creates a, some kind of a business that needs to be addressed. And from clinical documentation improvement to the UM to other aspects of care. So I'm thinking of others. Yeah, I've been enthralled lately. In fact, I signed up for a course to become a medical legal consultant. So we know about expert witness consulting. But there's something called pre-litigation consulting for medical legal for uh, personal injury and workers' comp cases, which does not involve any depositions, does not involve any testifying at court. But you go through, you review records, you look at the literature, and you advise attorneys on how to best present their case to the opposing counsel, and 90 plus percent of them end up being just settled. The whole point is to settle. And I think it's nice for us physicians if we do that is that uh, we're actually helping the patients, you know, get care for the next five or 10 years after they've been injured or something has happened at work. So there's a lot of really interesting kind of niche areas you can get into, but you have to do some digging. I usually advise people look for three to 12 months, just research the heck out of, just like when you're doing research for, let's say, investments or getting into real estate, you got to become an expert on, you know, what non-traditional, non traditional non clinical careers are out there, and then you can start narrowing it down. Absolutely. That's a great piece of advice. And when you talk about opportunities within hospitals themselves, medical director, medical advisor, CMO, what kind of qualifications does one need to do that? And how would that differ from, I know you've been a chief medical officer, you've also opened an urgent care center, maybe more than one. I'm not sure how many are in your business and whether you're still involved in that. We're up to three now. So that's good. I'm a, kind of a passive part of that at this point. I mean, I'm still a medical director remotely, but my partner CEO is opening the third one in, well, it's already under construction. We hope to get four. 
and uh, grow a little network. So I'm trying to weasel my way out of that at some point, but right now I'm still involved. But yeah, the hospital side. Yeah. If someone is considering all their options, what would be the requirements and what would be the difference really between clinical medicine practice and what some of those jobs entail on a day-to-day basis? Okay. Well, I want people to think as they're listening to this, to really think about what kind of jobs might be available in the hospital setting. So there's four major departments that hire physician managers and leaders that are not a service line. So quality improvement and patient safety is one. Clinical documentation improvement is another one. Utilization management is another one. And then informatics is the other big one in my mind. Those are big. So if you have background in any of those, plus a little bit of management experience, then you can advance better. However, remember that you can get a lot of experience and this whole pathway might start by being the medical director of pretty much any service line you can think of, you know, whether it has to do with if you're training, there's educational service lines or, you know, residents and medical students sometimes at different facilities. But the other ones that really come to mind are the respiratory, the cardiac, they all have medical directors for their service lines. And so you can get a lot of experience there. But what happens in the hospital setting these days is those positions are getting a little bit competitive. They pay really well. They have great benefits. The hours are good. I mean, it's 10 times better than grinding at a very busy, understaffed medical practice. I can tell you that. And it does help to do several things to document or to demonstrate your commitment and then your additional skills. So If you just take courses at the APL that you mentioned earlier, Association for Physician Leadership, that demonstrates a commitment and you're also learning, you know, negotiation and business and finance and that kind of thing. A lot of those people, though, if they're going to go for a CMO job or a CMIO, Chief Medical Informatics Officer or Chief Medical Information Officer, now there's also ones like Chief Quality Officer. That sounds pretty enticing to me. Chief Patient Safety Officer, even have Chief Equity Officer. I talked to a physician. I don't think there are a lot of those jobs out there, but they're there. So you normally need some additional training. And the most typical would be an MBA. And there's my sponsor on my podcast actually produces an MBA. It's a physician-only executive MBA. And then you've got MMM, which is Master's in Medical Management. You can do an MPH. You can do a MHA, right? Master's in Health Administration. So the thing is, you don't have to have those degrees necessarily when you apply. It's if you're matriculating in the middle of doing mostly these are offline executive type degrees, you know, that are teaching people that are actively working. That's pretty much enough to demonstrate to most employers that you're serious and that you have the knowledge. And, you know, if you're applying for your first job as an, let's say, a chief medical officer, and you don't quite have the degree, sometimes that's better because the hospital will hire you because they won't have to pay you as much at first because you're still learning. But they still, there's a shortage. So they will, you know, there's a lot of jobs. The thing about that is, you know, there's some travel involved or you have to move sometimes if you're not in a large metropolitan area where you can move from, you know, one location to another that are close by. But there's a lot of jobs in hospitals and health systems. If someone's interested in looking into applying for jobs Mm -hmm. like those, I know there are tons of job sites out there that are these huge job sites where maybe it would be a little bit hard to sort out what you're really looking for. I'm just curious what your advice would be. I would say I would look at the big ones like Indeed and others. Just It's more for research than it is for actually looking for a particular job. It's kind of one of the steps that I really recommend anybody do is like very, very early in the search, look at job descriptions more so you can just see what's required because you still have time to obtain additional certifications or experience that might apply. So that's one thing. And LinkedIn has a lot of those jobs, by the way. Although I would say if you're looking for a job that's an executive level or even in like an advanced medical director position in a hospital, I would find recruiting companies. So I think I have a list that I send out sometimes, but it includes executive physician recruiters. And I'm trying to think offhand of the big ones. There are about five or 10. And if you just look that up, physician executive recruiters, 
what you have to do is distinguish the ones that are recruiting physicians for practice versus, and some do both. And I've even interviewed, I think, one person on my podcast twice, and he's a recruiter. HCA, you know, big system that runs a bunch of hospitals, they have a dedicated recruiter for their sites. And they always have at least five to 10 openings for their hospitals in different parts of the country. So I would start with a big system like Kaiser, HCA, any other big system. And then I also find some headhunters or recruiters to go through. They don't all overlap with one another. So there's no problem going with, let's say, two or three recruiters. A big one is Cheka. Yeah, there are quite a lot of them. See, you probably know. So really just contact them. And the other thing about talking to a recruiter is, while they do have invested interest in recruiting to whatever hospitals are representing, they will give you a lot of information about what their systems are looking for. And that also helps inform you if you like, when you're early in the process, okay, well, which direction should I go if I'm going to get additional certifications or like some people feel like the CPE is more valuable than the MBA. CPE is a certification from the APL. Again, we'll get back to them. Although many of the CPEs have an MBA because you can use it to fulfill a criteria to get the CPE, but you can also fulfill a criteria just by going through other courses. So if you've already done courses for four or five years, you can apply for the CPE and get that, which is a certified physician executive. And I think a lot of hospitals put a lot of credence in that, but you certainly don't need both. Either one is something that demonstrates you've got the skills and you know the motivation to do that kind of job. That is terrific advice. And your thoughts about working with a recruiter, that's a really good takeaway tip because I think a lot of times physicians don't realize how much a recruiter can help really work to your advantage. It's basically like if you buy a house using a real estate agent. You have better Mm -hmm. negotiating power. They can tell you about the market. They know who else is interviewing and what your competition is. They know what Mm -hmm. those people are asking for in terms of salary. They know how high the salary can go. And they can be the middleman to negotiate that for you when you may not feel comfortable directly asking that from a potential employer. So I used to be a physician recruiter before medical school many years ago, and I've been on both sides of that of course, worked with recruiters as a physician. And I can just see that there are clear advantages that a lot of us don't realize are there through working with a recruiter. And by the way, their payment doesn't come out of our salary. It comes out of the business that's hiring is just looking for their help to make the process more efficient. So lots of advantages. So that's a really great point. And the other thing that that segues to in terms of thinking about questions is, For someone who wants to work remotely, do you have any specific advice on non-clinical careers? Yeah, I think the classic ones are things like medical writing. If you're a freelance medical writer, of course you can write and work from anywhere. It's not a difficult job to get into. I know many successful, but it takes a long time. They have to build a portfolio and they have to build relationships with different firms. You can get an employment position as a medical writer. You can do that for you know a communications company or a CME company. You can work for farm others writing jobs there, but those are all remote for the most part. Consulting jobs are remote, but then again, you're going to be, and I'm talking about the consulting for a major national or international healthcare firm like McKinsey or Accenture or something, but you end up doing a lot of travel as well, which could be good or bad. But you're not usually in an office, you know, every day. Of course, UM for the insurance companies is a classical remote position. That's why a lot of people go into it. It's a relatively low barrier to get in and you can work from home. And so that's good. Any kind of chart review job is remote, whether it's, you know, quality chart reviews that some companies need or sometimes state professional physicians, associations and societies need you know, for their licensing board and so forth. But other types of chart reviews are more along the line that we talked earlier for legal reasons, you know, expert witness and things like that. So those are pretty much remote unless you do the expert witness and have to show up in a deposition. Although I guess most of the depositions are online now as well. And rarely even a court appearance can be online. So, you know, maybe they're all 100% remote in some locations. Let's see, the other remote jobs... I do have a video on my website. I wish I had looked at it (laughs) recently. Let's see. Those are the big ones that I think of. 
I was going to say like CDI and UM, of course, CDI is like you, um, that's clinical documentation improvement. Because with EMRs now, you can review records electronically, even if you're working for a hospital and you don't have to, you know, actually physically be there. So those are the main ones. And when someone is getting started, especially if they're going the entrepreneurship route, even if they're starting their own business as a professional corporation just to pay themselves for whatever mm -hmm. the non clinical work, may be as a 1099 independent contractor, for example, I know you're getting together some groups through non-clinical careers academy or through your website. And I'm really interested in hearing about how that's working with mastermind groups. Yeah. Mastermind groups are a wonderful thing. They've been around for a long time. I started doing some masterminds a couple of years ago through my work because I like the idea of getting together with a group of other physicians, typically it's what I do. And there are different ways that those things can be put together. Like I've been to masterminds that run over a weekend. So it's a couple of days, everybody gets to spend 30 to 60 minutes at a time discussing a major challenge with the entire group. The group can be anywhere from 20 to 100 or even more people. And the thing about a mastermind is you have kind of built-in accountability if it's a recurring one, because you're going to have to come back and explain whether you took their advice or their aha moments that you, you know, identified yourself and took action. So you've got that accountability. You've got the networking built into all the people that are in the group. You've got the brainstorming. You've got a ton of support. I can't tell you how many people in my masterminds have been really frustrated and, you know, getting down on themselves and so forth. And the other members of the group really built them up, say, you know, you are one of the most intelligent people I know. I know your heart's in the right place. You know, all these things that just, because you're getting this third party observation of your skills and reminding you. But the kind of mastermind that I do, I was looking for a type that I could do, you know, over time, with like an ongoing relationship. In some ways, it's sort of like group coaching, but you know, it doesn't really meet the criteria for group coaching because we're not really coaching one another, but we are supporting and advising one another. And so I get this group of, let's say, five to eight or 10 physicians together, and we meet on a monthly basis. I tried the every two week process, but now I'm doing it monthly. And we each get to be on the hot seat. So we all get a turn. So it has to be relatively abbreviated. So we try to stick to one small challenge each time. But then by meeting over time, you all make progress, you move forward, you have the support, you have the accountability. And there's a book called The Eight Minute Mastermind, which is basically what I use to design mine. Now we usually get 10 to 15 minutes on the hot seat. So it's not done in eight minutes, but it's a process, I think, that is well-defined in that book. And it's just amazing. In our case, we're looking for help with finding the first non-clinical job. So it's not a leadership you know, mastermind focusing on those things. I know there are a lot that do that. And so what's interesting is how much research and how much knowledge the members of the group have about other non-clinical options, even though they haven't pursued them because they've done all this research just like I did five, six, seven years ago. And so the ideas are just unbelievable. And some of the people that attend are, you know, part-time coaches, you know, so I always love having the coaches because they know how to ask those open-ended questions. And it's just, uh, we have people sometimes that are in, in the mastermind for a month or two, and they've already found their first job just because of a simple suggestion that one of the members made. So it's pretty fun. It's interesting. It's powerful. And I would suggest to anybody who is in like the situation I'm describing where you kind of need a little help and maybe you don't have a coach already, you can form your own mastermind group. I mean, get three to five people together and just create this group, meet on a regular basis, could be in person, could be online, and just follow a process, you know, like I've described. Now I'm selling seats at masterminds now as I move forward, as these things get bigger and more popular. So if people want to check that out, they can go to nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash mastermind. But it's not that hard to start your own mastermind, you know, just to uh, get things off to a start. I do think that would be extremely valuable. It certainly seems that having peer support and mentorship 
type of environment can really accelerate your progress. So I think that's terrific that you're doing that. And similarly with mentorship, that's really a, a powerful theme in what you and Dr. Tom Davis are doing with New Script. Yeah, I think, yeah, we, I think we mentioned that last time I was on, but it's great. We have almost 600 members now. And it's sort of like a Facebook lookalike without any of the ads, you know, that you would get in a Facebook setting. So it's clinicians, it involves physicians, nurses, dentists, anyone who's pretty much a licensed healthcare provider. Particularly, you know, it's, it attracts, I think, mostly those who have been kind of hit by the pandemic or frustrated or, you know, just fed up with the corporate practice of medicine. And that affects a lot of different people in the hospital besides physicians. So we welcome everybody that falls into that category. And we have mentors like you who, you know, are there and that can be reached out to in addition to me and Tom, we, there's about 10 other mentors and just people who are in there sharing their expertise and responding to questions. And then uh, we do put a lot in there that's just available to people that come in as, you know, just a resources. I have old podcast episodes that I thought would be germane to those conversations just posted in there. They can listen to any time. Tom has live streams all the time. I've done live streams. Actually, this past weekend, I did a webinar and it was basically for NewScript. I invited some other people, but it was really designed for NewScript and it was free. You know, so we're always putting a lot of, quote, free content. I guess technically it's not free because we do have a membership charge, $8 or a little bit less, I think $7.99 a month or something. But yeah, and so we just try and put as much material in there that people really almost could never get through if they wanted to. You know, it's just what they're interested in. There's something for most everybody. But we're continuing to grow it. I mean, we really see long-term, we have a lot more content for a much broader audience and just make it as easy as possible for clinicians to get help again, kind of at the beginning, you know? One of the reasons we have people like that are coaches as mentors is that they can develop relationships with those coaches outside of NewScript. And we have no problem with that. Or people have online courses that they sell and so forth too that are not in new script, but it's just a way to get those people together where they wouldn't otherwise necessarily have that relationship. Absolutely. And I'm excited to let people know that part of the new script membership now includes your own access to the doc working portal where people can get our weekly one minute coaching sessions and then they have access to the whole portal where they can choose to purchase yeah. other courses if they want to for CME credit to support their well-being. And so uh, No, that's very exciting because I, you know, I watch 90% of the one minute. What do you call them again? One minute the weekly one minute coaching sessions. Coaching. So yeah. So I the ones I'm looking at is Jill Farmer's doing the ones that most of the ones I've looked at. I don't know if she does them all, if you do some or other people do some, but she does them all. Oh, She's the co-host of the podcast <laughs> here. Yes. Anyway, yeah, I love those. And I, I mean, I've been a part of the Doc Working Thrive in that for, I think, a year or so now. They are very, very good. And we're really happy to be able to have that integrated into New Script and have that access. And I think you'll see more things like that. Tom and I were talking the other day and, well, he's doing some, I don't know if I should tell you this, but I should. <laughs> he's doing some outside consulting. He said, you know what? This type of consulting, I'm not going to do any more outside of New Script. I'm just going to do it in New Script for for free as part of the membership. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. And uh, so we've got some other things cooking too in, in New Script. So, but we really appreciate the relationship with you and the others at Doc Working Thrive. Well, likewise, we do too. And we also are going to be putting New Script into our portal so that Doc Working members can check out New Script and Oh, really, yeah. the resources there are tremendous. I find all of the content that you guys are putting out to be really useful. And I love your short videos as well. They're very helpful and different from the coaching videos, but uh, really <laughs> yeah. good advice. Yeah, I've gotten to do more videos. Where I've decided I used to write like a daily email that I would put in there. And uh, I still do that from time to time. And those usually have stories and some of them there are pretty funny and they're from my life. And so sometimes I'm making a fool of myself and as a way to, you know, demonstrate a point. But 
I'm getting to the point now where I like doing those short one or two or three minute videos because really they're not that difficult to do. And I think some people just prefer seeing like a person rather than just reading something on a blog. Yeah, I agree. It, it's really helpful to hear about your experiences and Tom's as well and other mentors that you have on the site. And it's exciting to see people coming on from all over the world. Yeah, and uh, I should maybe mention this too, just for those that like TikTok, you can find Tom Davis on TikTok if you can believe that. And he's on it every day. And I don't know, some of those are pre recorded, but they're very good. They're very similar. They're a way to kind of pull people into New Script, but very similar to the videos in New Script. And there's always like some really useful information in there. So that's been interesting to watch. Well, tell me again how people can find you if they're interested in your mastermind groups and how about if they're interested in new script okay first i think last time i was here i gave the link to something free and i'll do another one today just because i think what we're talking about is non-clinical career so if you go to nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash free webinar one so it's all one word free webinar one there's like a short webinar where I go through like 30 non-clinical careers and just trying to describe them just to kind of raise awareness of what's there. It's free. I, just, I don't think there's any selling in it at all. Okay. Otherwise, I can go to nonclinicalphysicians.com. That's the website. And there's a place to sign up for my daily email there if they like that and lots of other things. And then New Script. I think the easiest way to get to New Script is newscript.app. So it's N E W S C R. IPT. That's because <laughs> it's kind of a play on words. So it's like our members should be building or creating a new script for their careers or their lives. So new script.app. And uh, I think that's that should help. Thank you so much again, Dr. John Jerica, for coming and talking with me today. And thank you for your valuable insights about non clinical careers and just hearing about everything you have going on is really inspiring. You're welcome very much. It's really my pleasure. And it's always fun to talk with you, Jen. So we'll be talking again soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. Look forward to it. At Doc Working, we're here to help you maximize your potential on your own terms and help you live your best life. Top executives, athletes, actors, all achieve greatness with the support of professional coaches. As a healthcare professional, you deserve ongoing coaching towards success in your career and in your life outside of work, helping you to balance and integrate work and life in the personalized way that is specific to you. At Doc Working, your success is defined by you and our coaching programs help accelerate your path to get you there. And since our programs come with CME credit, you can let your CME budget help you to prioritize your own well-being. Please check us out at docworking.com. And until next time, thank you for listening to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast.